Okay. That's the fourth market. Now, what's the fifth and the sixth market? Well, you read about that in that one Business Week article that I assigned at the beginning of the semester. The fifth market is when institutions become market makers on their own behalf. And so what does that mean? Well, remember when we talked about the idea that as mutual funds got bigger and more sophisticated in the analytical work that they did back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, rather than going to a market maker because of that soft dollar compensation and the high cost of trading through another company that represented a market maker, it was a lot easier for companies like Fidelity or big insurance companies or big brokerage companies just to become their own market makers. Banks did the same thing. This is how banks got into the business of exchanging and trading securities as well. So rather than calling Interstate Johnson Lane when First Union wanted to buy Treasury securities, why not just hire a level three NASDAQ market maker in the bond market and buy and sell your own securities? That's the fifth market. When institutions become market makers for proprietary trading purposes. They're not trading for client customers or client exchanges. They're trading for their own portfolio. And so if I've got a big position, let's say in Bank of America, and I want to run that position down, all I need to do is set my ask a little lower than the other ask prices in the market, and I'll sell out my inventory or I'll sell down my inventory. On the other hand, if I've got a weak position and I want to accumulate stock in a particular company, I just raise my bid a little bit higher than other bids in the market, and I bring securities into my inventory. And so the fifth market is when institutions become market makers for their own accounts, rather than hiring a market maker to work for them. Why would you do that? Because it's cheaper to have your own people on staff because you're in and out of the market all the time. You might not be trading continuously during the day, but if you've got a Quotron 3 terminal and you've got a NASDAQ Level 3 licensed market maker that's one of the staff in the company, when you want to trade, just fire up the terminal and trade away. When you don't want to trade, just shut down the terminal because you don't have to go to spread. So whenever they're doing that, though, like, doesn't that affect the prices, like the bid prices mm -hmm. for the other companies? Like, yeah, that's what's called the locked market and a crossed market that you're going to learn about in just a minute. Because that's why the market will lock and the market will cross. Okay, But you haven't learned about locked markets and crossed markets. Give me a minute and you'll get there. Okay, that's it for the fifth market. Now, I invented this term for the sixth market. And I call the sixth market when individuals become market makers for their own accounts, just like institutions. When I looked at the evolution of the market going back 20 years ago, you know, I sort of thought originally, because I didn't see the development of ECNs back in the 80s and the 90s either, what I thought would eventually happen would be that NASDAQ would create like a retail market. So you could go back to that OTC bulletin board system and you could drop down <coughs> one more level and you could have like a retail marketplace where individuals could act as their own market makers. So I know enough about quote and bid ask spread buying and selling securities. I don't need any help when I go into the market to buy stock. So why not just let me be my own market maker, but give me level two access rather than level three access so that eventually somebody has to oversee me or look over my shoulder because I'm not a licensed market maker. See that? So if that ever evolved, and it didn't evolve that way because we evolved in a different direction, and I'll explain in just a minute, that would have been the sixth market where you take that institutional customer that made a market for himself or herself, and you extend that concept to the retail market. At one time, I thought that was how the market was going to evolve, and it didn't because of ECMs, and it didn't because of deep discount brokers and the internet. And I'll explain that in just a minute, because that's the next and the final step. So the seventh market that I have there, and I'll be right back there, the seventh market, you know, is the development of electronic communication networks. And as I said, I think they're sufficiently different that they don't belong listed along with the OTC market. Because the OTC stuff is about market makers and bid-ask spreads and inventories and all that kind of thing. And ECNs aren't about any of that stuff. It's just a computer and a subscriber service and a bunch of data lines that run into the back of the computer. And then after the seventh market comes the eighth market. If you remember back to 
one of the first couple of days that we talked in class, and I talked about a market is a venue that brings together people for purposes of exchange. And we said the trading rules that occur in a market with respect to setting price can be different in different markets. And so I talked about a catalog model, an auction model, and a brokerage model where you've got an exchange model where you've got a bid ask spread. Remember that then? Mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, when you look at market structure today, markets for the most part operate under one single pricing rule. So you've got a catalog model when you go to Kmart. You've got an exchange model with a bid-ask spread when you go to the stock market. Or if you go to an auction, you've got an auction model, which could be a Dutch auction, a Vickery auction, or an English auction. Different rules in different auction environments. Well, look at what eBay has done, and look at what Amazon has done with that buy now button. What they've done is they've turned an auction market into a catalog market simply by allowing you, the buyer or the seller, to make a choice as to how you're going to list the way you want to negotiate with the opposite side of the transaction. Do you want people to bid for the item or do you just want to post a price and take that price if people are willing to pay it? And then you let market participants decide which pricing rule they want to use to negotiate price. When I go on eBay and I buy little stuff on eBay, I don't want to screw around with an auction. I don't want to follow the thing for the next 10 days. I look at where the price of the item is in terms of past auctions and where it's sold. Then I click on show me all of the buy now button offers. And if I see a buy now that's reasonable, I just buy it. Because I don't want to screw around with the amount of time it takes for an auction. Well, if you're buying antiques or art or something that's really expensive and hard to value, then it's worth the extra time it takes to screw around with an auction type model. But if you're just buying something for 50 or 60 bucks, you know, why waste the time? Just click on the buy now button, buy it now if the price seems to be reasonable. So the eighth market is where you create an electronic venue that allows participants to alter the rules that they use to set price, all in one venue. And we're awful close to that in the stock market today with the New York Stock Exchange and Archipelago. Because when you go to the New York Stock Exchange, you can take the order to the floor of the exchange if you want to. Or if it's a security that's routinely traded and highly liquid, like most nicely listed companies are, Shit, just trade it in the ECN. It doesn't make any sense to take that to the floor of the exchange. It's not worth the effort, which is why Archipelago's volume is huge compared to what goes on on the floor of the exchange. The only missing piece from the eighth market in that regard is internet IPOs. If we had Dutch auction capability on the New York Stock Exchange for offering an internet IPO, that would be the eighth market because you can allow the characteristics of what it is you're trading to determine the way you negotiate price. And that's the great leap forward in the market, in my view. Because some things are better priced at a catalog model, some things at an exchange model, some things with an auction model. You know, when you buy toothpaste, you don't need a bid-ask spread. Shit, who sells toothpaste back to the market maker? Nobody. And so the catalog market works best for that particular item. On the other hand, if you've got something that's illiquid, that's not traded very often, that you're buying with the expectation that at some point you want to be able to sell it and you need a venue in which to sell it, that's where the exchange model with the market maker or the specialist quoting a bid-ask spread, that's where that works best. And on the other hand, if you're bringing a new company to market that the world's never seen before, internet IPOs are much more efficient than traditional underwriting through an investment bank. You see that with the articles that I gave you about Google and how efficiently Google went public. But remember, the institutional market has blocked, has resisted the idea of internet IPOs because internet IPOs cut the cost of going public. Well, who makes the money associated with the cost of going public? Goldman and Morgan. 
And so those are the two companies that really have resisted internet IPOs, which means if you're Joe's Auto Parts, you have no market power in the market when you go public. You want Goldman or Morgan to take you public because that's the good housekeeping seal of approval. If they're willing to take on in a negotiated underwriting your stock and bear the underwriting risk associated with that, that says something about the staying power of your company in the market and conveys value to the stock when it's traded in the market for the first time. On the other hand, if you're Google, you look at gold and you say, shit, we know who you, people know who we are more than they know who you are, you work for us, we're going to go public on our own, which is why Google did a Dutch auction internet driven IPO. It's a much better way to issue stock, but how many Facebooks and Googles and archipelagos and you know, what was the other one? Alibaba was the most recent internet IPO. Remember, Alibaba was the biggest IPO in history, the Chinese version of Amazon. Those companies can do it because they got market power. But most companies that go public don't have anywhere near that kind of market power. <clears throat> Going back to like the institution where when individuals like become a market maker, you said the difference between that is like a level two. Yeah, well, uh, uh, remember, if you're an institutional investor, you would have a free terminal because I would hire you as a licensed market maker to work for my company to okay, rebalance okay. my portfolio when we need to buy and sell. And I'm just going to put you on payroll. I mean, I do enough trading in our business. This company does enough trading that we can in turn keep you busy and it's going to cover the cost of your salary to save the brokerage commissions that I would normally pay to an outside licensed market maker just to do it in-house. And so I take that capability in-house. Well, that, that what happens when a business does it. But what happens to an individual when an individual becomes or has the ability to trade through the NASDAQ system on their own? Well, you wouldn't want to give them a, a level three terminal because they're not licensed market makers. So they could act under the supervision of a licensed market maker, looking at a Quotron 2 and then submitting an order to a Quotron 3 terminal. That's SOS Bandit. I gave you an article about SOS Bandits, where the guy at the front of the room is a licensed NASDAQ market maker, and I'm looking at a 3. I put you in front of a 2, and when you want to trade, you just tell me what you want to trade. I execute the trade, and I point back and say, confirm. And so basically, that is an example of that sixth market. SOS Bandit was an example of the sixth market, and the market makers hated it. Because as I say, when you see those bid experts changing, if you went to the bathroom or if you looked away from the screen or you went to talk to somebody over here and the market started to move while you weren't paying attention, you got hit with all these so's banded orders. When the market was moving up, if you didn't move your spread up, you got hit with a bunch of buy orders because people were buying you at a bargain price. And you're saying, oh shit, look, I'm selling out my inventory and I'm an eighth below the market. And again, before, SOS bandits were out there, you didn't have so much acuity in terms of making sure you, it wasn't as sharp where you had to change your price when everybody else changed their price or you wind up getting hit. That's why when you read that article, I'm going to show it to you on Monday, you know, you've got all the market makers bitching and moaning about how these SOS bandits screw up the market. They didn't screw up the market, they made it more efficient. You know, but they didn't make it more volatile. What all the market makers say is, oh, they create volatility. No, they don't. They follow volatility. And so, like I say, you got to watch what, you, what, what people say. Because what people say and the truth are often two different things in this business. That's the sixth one. And then only people with love, access to level one are specialists, right? Level three. Level one, two. Not a specialist, the market maker. Market. Less vocabulary. Yeah. Specialists in the physical exchanges, market makers, and the OTC market, right? They do the same role, but they do it differently. There's no central limit yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. on the market makers. Am I out of time? Yeah, yes. I'm out of time. Oh, this stuff takes time to cover. Okay, we're through all of that. We are on to bid ask spreads and understanding how to manipulate a bid ask spread. So, your job for Monday, I'm going to turn you into market makers, and you're going to turn quote a spread, and you're going to trade from inventory moving that spread around, and you're going to manage your limit book. Won't that be fun? Nice. Okay.